going for a ride. There Another ride in a car. <laughs> Had a little technical difficulty there. Uh, sorry about that. That's okay. uh, but we're starting again. Okay, so I've got the privilege of taking uh, Julie Ellis on a ride. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh, it's great to be here. Um, Julie Ellis is the uh, founder of Mabel's Labels which is something I knew nothing about a couple years ago until I had children, and now I know lots about it, and they're everywhere. Yeah, you have house. them everywhere, yeah. That's it. And they're awesome. So thank, thank you so you. much for contributing that to the world. <laughs> uh, and I know you're, whole bunch, you're up to a whole bunch of stuff these days, so maybe you can just kind of give the audience a little introduction and how you end up into Mavis Labels, yeah. and then what you're up to today. Sure. Great. Yeah, I grew up uh, not far from here in Cambridge, and then went to the University of Waterloo, where I met a group of friends that later married their brother. <laughs> two sisters, a bunch of other people, but I married the brother of these two sisters, and we uh, ended up all staying really close and having babies around the same time, awesome. and yeah, and I was working as a financial planner after I finished school, and we all were in this, you know, we had toddlers, we were starting to send them to daycare, the daycare started saying, please label everything, and when you would say, well, how, they would say, well... You could use a Sharpie and a marker. <laughs> and like, so, figure it out. Yeah. And so we were kind of in this position where we wanted to do something different and leave our sort of traditional jobs. So we kind of saw a market opportunity to build something that wasn't really around at that point in time. So we did a ton of research and testing, and we got somebody to build us a website in exchange for a foosball table. Nice. <laughs> and we literally uh, yeah, best. started making labels in 2003, and it was a weird little time to sell direct on the internet. It was really early in terms yeah. of, you know, no one wanted to give us merchant numbers for credit cards and all kinds of fun things. But right. we, you know, persevered, and we started business. And then we owned it for about 13 years all together, the four of us that founded it. And then we sold it to Avery Labels back at the end of 2015. Huge. Huge. Uh, so there's a whole bunch I want to unpack there, mm -hmm. obviously. Uh, and then today, so that was four years ago. Yeah. What are you up to now? So since then, I've been out in the world doing a little bit of consulting. And one of my consulting clients turned into a job and I helped him run his business for a while and that business was called Snugglebugs. Oh yeah. It's called Snugglebugs. So There's a theme baby, here. baby retailer. Yeah, 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 I like the children's product industry. Yeah. Um, people are fun and they're nice and it was in interesting to go from being an e-commerce retailer over to bricks and mortar yeah, that's cool. stores as well as an e-commerce retailer. Uh, so that was super interesting and I uh, really enjoyed it and then decided I wanted to kind of move on and work for myself again, and I've been doing some coaching, leadership coaching for entrepreneurs and executives, and uh, doing working on getting a coaching certification, and doing a little consulting, and doing some work with entrepreneurs in the startup world through our regional innovation center in Burlington. Okay, awesome. And what's the name of that one? It's called Haltech. Haltech, yeah. 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 Sweet. So you've, you've you know had babies, had a, yeah. found a problem, yeah. solved the problem with some Mother friends. Mother of invention, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah seriously totally. though, right? Yeah. So um, in terms of starting this thing up, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the whole startup um, kind of landscape, environment, mindset, perceptions, that kind yeah. of stuff, uh, what, what, what was it actually like? I mean, you said you built a website, you trained for a foosball table, yeah, right? I did. So I mean... And yeah, so none of the four founders had technology in there. Really, we had a teacher, we had a lawyer, we had somebody who worked in digital printing, and we had a financial planner, me. So we kind Seems of like started, it was a good mix, team, yeah. but no technology, no yeah, right? Yeah. So we got started and had the website built and um, had a guy who helped us do a lot of kind of automation things because we were basically disrupting in the printing industry, because which is a very old industry. Sure. And lots of the people we encountered thought we were fully crazy to do what we were doing and that it would never work. So we would buy equipment and discover that whatever software came with the equipment wouldn't do what we needed it to do. So eventually we hired some somebody on full time to build us our own ERP base. Yeah, okay, so starting from the beginning. Yeah. First twelve months of operations. First twelve months. What did you yeah. do in revenue? 
probably, well, I think the first year we did about 30,000, but the next year we went over half a million. So oh, it so grew really fast. Yeah. And was the 30,000 um, online? Yep. All of that was online. So all the sales All of it's happening. online. Yeah. So what we learned was early on, we got a very lucky break and we got a write up in Canadian Living. Okay. And it was just at the back and it was a tiny little like two and a half by one inch on a parenting page making a note about us. And about four months after that magazine hit the stage, hit the stand, sorry, we had this one day, it was like January, and all of a sudden the business was in my sister-in-law's house and she could hear the phone and it was ringing and ringing and ringing and the phone did not ring like that. Right. And so, you know, she was upstairs with her kids. She was going to go down and work later that day. And finally, she couldn't stand it anymore. So she went downstairs and she was like, you know, hello, Mabel's Labels. And her said, I have got to order your labels. And she said, where did you hear about us? And right. they were like, the Daily Candy. And she's like, what is this? And so the phone keeps ringing all day. And eventually, later in the afternoon, a woman phones and she says, so how's your day been? Has it been super busy? And my sister-in-law, Cynthia, was like, it's been crazy. Like, what's going on? And she's like, well, I submitted you to this email subscriber list that tells parents about the hottest thing going cool, and <laughs> what you should buy. And so that was the beginning of that leveraged us into another era of media coverage. And, yeah. we got, you know, we got on The View. Elizabeth Hasselbeck stood on The View at that time in 2006 and said, I could not live without these. <laughs> Thank <And> then, you. <laughs> We had, it was free, yeah. total free endorsement. And then we had the biggest sales period of, in the next 24 hours the company had ever seen in that time. So, we, you know, we were building on all of this and getting a lot of media coverage. And we did eventually hire a PR person. But in the early days, we did a lot of it ourselves. Yeah, I guess so, especially when starting to snowball like that. Yeah. Yeah, and we had a great product and people liked it and we stood by it and it did what we said it would do. Yeah, which is, I mean, that's really at the core of any business. Yeah. Um, but then you mentioned this idea of disrupting the printing business. Yes. I think you explained so, it before, So here, maybe you could break it down. Quickly. Yeah, and so here we are building this fun brand on the front end, right? That looks like, you know, Mabel's Label so cute, so fun. We have early adopters of social media, all of those kinds of things. Don't lose your kids' stuff. Absolutely. All about your kids' stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah they get and, to come and home with all the stuff schools could they fundraise. Back. Preschools could fundraise to make, you know, earn some money and keep things out of the lost and bound. And awesome. so we did all kinds of things like that. But on the back end, what we were finding was the equipment we were buying and the software that came with it couldn't handle printing one million teeny tiny little things, which is what we were doing. <laughs> and so we started looking at writing our own software. And you know, it can print, it just wasn't designed to do it. And the software that came with it wouldn't facilitate very well right, as right. we started to scale. Yeah. And so we ended up writing basically our own ERP that handled orders from the back end of the website through to shipping out of the building. Huge. 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 Huge undertaking for four founders that no one's a technologist. And, I mean, at the time we sold the business, 25% of the employees, we had about 10 people that were in IT. Right. Wow. So, yeah. So, so eventually... What, what was it like then? Sorry, go ahead. Eventually. No, well, eventually I... IT came under my umbrella. Yeah, okay. And that was in about 2008, I think. And um, building the team and, take, you know, bringing the website work into, like, you know, using uh, our own team plus an outside contractor to build a big new website and going on to new platforms and all of those kinds of things. And so we were making huge technology changes within the company. Yeah. And uh, it was really challenging and a lot of fun. So then, so coming from financial planning, <laughs> financial services, yep. into the technology team, yep. like what's that transition like? Um, it was interesting because some of the things I can see around systemizing and putting project in place and goals and and kind of creating a rhythm lends itself well to managing IT. You know, we adopted. Uh, we adopted a sprint methodology where, you know, we were working in two week chunks and we were having wrap up meetings and using a Trello board to track our tasks. And so putting those systemizations in place um, is kind of what I can do. And I had some good outside advisors that I could bounce the, you know, does this, 
does that sound right to you? Because I'm feeling like the wind's not blowing the way I need it to. So I could kind of, you know, start to, and I learned a lot about, deeply about our system and those kinds of things. You would not have wanted me to write a line of code. Right. But I learned a lot about, you know, how things worked and why they worked that way. And the logic behind it all. Yes. And I could be a good liaison between the complexity of the development team and the rest of the staff in terms of translating what it all meant. Cool. And then also having the customer in mind the whole time. Yes. Yeah. It's yeah. So you mentioned the idea of outside advisors. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these I'm in a cars I do people mention this idea of mentorship yeah. and yeah. you know, being around so what was that like for you? We didn't ever have a board of directors other than the founders or a board of advisors, so to speak. But we always used a number of advisors over the course of the business. Um, some of them were paid. Some of them were more mentor advisors, yeah, I would okay. say. Um, but we, you know, very early on had a moment where we had a prof at UW, who's a prof of ours, Larry Smith, and he used to give us time and, you know, a couple of hours every year and sit down with us because he found the business kind of fascinating. And at one point, I remember saying, I can't get my head around taxing jurisdictions in the U.S. and what taxes we have to charge, and how are we even supposed to do that? We're a small business, and, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, it's not just selling stuff online, right? No. There's a lot of implications. Exactly, and I couldn't, you know, we weren't getting the advice we needed, and I remember he looked at me, and he said, Julie, with all due respect, your accountant is not doing his job. Straight and up. I was like, it was like he switched the light on above me, so I knew he was right. And so that sent us on a journey of he introduced us to our accountant that we still work with today. I still work with him personally. And so, you know, that was a great example. And then, you know, Bill, who became our accountant, we paid him as an advisor for a really long time, both as our accountant. He led strategic planning sessions for us. Cool. Um, all those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then, we, you know, we had different people with different expertise that we would bring around the business well, when we needed advice. So I've... Sadly, I've heard this tale before yeah. of an accountant, maybe not, where they need to be you know, in order to get the company where it wants to go. Right. So some, you know, they're yeah. obviously great people, but maybe sometimes this is so great. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not sure if everybody has a good understanding of what an accountant is actually supposed to do for a company right. outside of, like, bookkeeping and taxes. And a lot of them, that's what they do. It's mecha the mechanics of it versus right. the... Um, thinking around how should the business be structured? What are the tax implications in the long term of structuring and doing work like, you know, having holding companies and different entities owning shares and why should you, why would you, is it even right? And yeah. How are you, you know, having someone who's helping you think about those things? Because that's certainly beyond filing paperwork. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know? And even strategizing, like at one time in our business, we um, brought out a line of labels that we sold into Walmart in Canada and Target in the U.S. And those were on the fly, personalized them with a Sharpie, same kind of durability, dishwasher, microwave, laundry. Right. But you could go and pick them up today instead of waiting for your custom mail order. But that was like going to China, finding a supplier, bringing them to Canada. And, you know, for a lot of reasons, we decided to put that in a separate company. Right, right, right. Right? Different profit model, different all kinds of things. And, and without somebody who could really sit with us and think all of that through, I don't know where you would, how you would know that. Yeah, that's cool. That's, and I think it's just a really cool lesson for anybody watching yeah. this. Um, make sure your accountant's doing a great job. Yeah. Uh, so then, so you're, you've got some advisors. How did you, how did you identify them? Uh, at the beginning, like this professor you had was just like kind of because you had built a relationship going to school. Yeah. And was there yeah. anybody else that you had met along the way that was uh, impactful? Yeah, I mean, we, so we at one time also in the later years had a coach who I would say was an operational advisor. And he would come to our, like our leadership team meetings for the four of us and like just help us sort through. And he helped us as far through as the sales. So he worked extensively with us and he was a great connector. So he had a great, be like, I think you should meet so-and-so because they're doing this and that might be useful. And cool. just that expanding your network piece, um, I think is really important. Sure. Absolutely. And so like, um, is there any other spots where you found that you mentioned when you got in the car, I'm, I'm listening to the great game of business. 
Yeah. And you mentioned there's like this annual conference they do, which yeah. I did not know about, and I'm actually really interested to check it out. Yeah. I've never been to Missouri either. There you so go. Why not check it why out? Why not? Right. Um, but is there any other spots that you know a- along the way you found are like, hey, these are must must attend type of things? Um, we would attend things like, you know, uh, things in our sector like printing shows and children's product shows and that sort of thing to build a network to sell and learn, but also to build a network. But then we would also do things in our sort of subject matter areas. Uh, one of the things that we got interested in and ultimately implemented in the business was um, having a row, a yeah, results only go. workplace, Very cool. which was based on a book called Work Sucks and What to Do About It. Uh, these two women out of Minneapolis wrote the book, Jody and Callie, and they um, had implemented the system at Best Buy. That's where it came out of. Work sucks and what to do about yeah. it. Love it. And really, a row, it's a results only work environment. And people are responsible for being grown-ups and getting their work done. And so we used to like to refer to it as there were sort of three overlapping circles. There was your work, your department's work, and the company's needs, right? So you had your needs, you had your department needs, you had your company needs. And there's an intersection in those three circles where you have to try and balance those three things. So some of the rules in a row, like if you get invited to a meeting and the person doesn't publish an agenda or you have no real part or meaning in being in that meeting, you can decline. Uh, oh, nobody's, awesome. Yep. Everybody just stood up and cheered the, like yep. a lot of organizations. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, but it's, it seems so simple that you don't go to a meeting without an agenda, oh, man. but it happens all the time and then it's not productive. Right. Yeah. Um, other things like you could work remotely work you know if you had to be offline you needed to communicate but like I had one guy in my IT team who worked from Europe for six weeks yeah like how cool was that yeah he traveled around he had things he had to sort out because he was a point person for a couple of in-office tasks so he needed to find somebody on his team that would cover him for that and you know then he dialed in remotely from for all of the meetings he needed to from wherever he was he was in berlin and amsterdam and you name it and uh for him he'd find a co-working space and pay his five bucks a day or whatever and yeah. go and and meet other developers doing other things and to him that gave him energy for the job he had very cool it was really cool and so yeah. it, and it, uh, i think so was it fully implemented then? Yeah. Um, yes, and we had hired. Yeah, and we hired Callie and Jody to come and implement it. The people who wrote the book, and so they came up, and we did a whole team building thing, and and basically talked about how it was going to work. Um, some of the outcomes. Some people don't like working in that environment. It makes it very, um, you know, the accountability moves from the manager to the team in a lot of ways, right? And so you have to set goals properly, and you have to be careful and conscious about people's job breadth and size like you know somebody's overworked and somebody else doesn't have enough to do or that sort of thing it it can get but um and some people really don't like it and they decided to self-select one of the other things that comes with a row though is unlimited vacation yeah well that's the whole idea yeah I just think this whole nine to five thing was created by the industrial revolution yes it was which is a falsehood of the way we work and live as humans because it's only been 130 years maybe um, versus 4,000 years before that where 9 to 5 wasn't a thing and farmers farmed when they could farm and butchers butched when they butched like it it wasn't a punching clock out but it was all because people were taking advantage of humans and unions came involved and said hey we need a balance you can't just work people 14, 15 hours a day until they die but that's not where we're at anymore Right. So no, we're in this 24-7 digital world where people are always on yeah. to a large degree. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people think that unlimited vacation is a scary thing. We found that on average people took about three weeks, between three and four weeks vacation. Like it was very reasonable. Very reasonable. And people felt like, you know, if they wanted to go and see their kids play or they had a dentist appointment and they were coming in an hour late to work, like... All of that just happened and you just lived your life and did your work and nobody was saying you were three minutes late today. Nobody was saying. So it eliminated a lot of that kind of sludge is what the program calls it. Yeah, sure. Um, where you're judging somebody. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. You know, 
So it just takes away some of those things, which makes the environment a lot more collaborative. Very cool. So you, you mentioned uh, you were working in sprints, kind of yes. sprints, true of scrum methodology. Yes, yeah. yeah. We were using a modified scrum methodology. Yeah, that's okay. That's yeah. And then you talked about row. Yeah. So you, you've essentially... Uh, I'm under the impression self-educated yep. through exposure to reading books. Yes, definitely, idea. definitely big book readers and adopters of ideas. We also spent a lot of time back probably more than a decade ago now, say it was 2006 to 2008, we spent time ourselves going to culture immersions at Zappos and sending some of our leaders to them as well uh, to try and figure out how they were doing it and what they were doing because we really wanted to build a great culture in our business. And And we did. We had a great culture. And it was super interesting to go and see how they were doing it and to say, these are things we like, these are things we wouldn't want to do. Yeah, well, they have a crazy, quirky culture, right? Crazy, quirky culture. And (laughs) and they had expectations of, like, their managers had to spend 10% of their work week outside the office with their teams right, like right. they go hiking on Saturdays and they go and like we knew we didn't want to go back to that kind of level but we knew that the way they treated their customers and the way they treated their employees was something that we really wanted to be a part of that's cool mm-hmm. yeah and so a whole bunch of people went down for those and we really you know we had then brought back a you know company values and we you know developed some things like Super cool. So then mm-hmm. when it comes to those types of initiatives and you have the four founders, yeah. um, did you break off into like kind of what would be stereotypical kind of role positions in terms of presidents and CEOs no. and CEO or how did, <laughs> how did all that no. function from a decision-making um, perspective? So we all were, so, title aside, we were basically co-CEOs. We were all four vice presidents. That's what the title that we gave ourselves was. And we each took portfolios of different departments and responsibilities within the business. And then we worked those. And then we came together for a bi-weekly meeting of a couple of hours to kind of work out, you know, what needed to be hashed out. Yeah, that's cool. So, yeah. meaning each person was a VP of a functional yeah. department? Yeah, or, or, or a couple of them. Like sales and marketing, operations, yeah. administration, finance? Yeah, it was finance, IT, and then retail, when we had the retail product. Um, we had HR and production, we had marketing and sales, so yeah, just all of the different kind of pieces. Yeah, okay, cool, and then mm-hmm. you, and then you just meet up afterwards yeah. on that. So that's, well, what, what size team of... We had about 40 people when we sold. And you started with four. Yep. And you were doing thirty thousand dollars revenue your first year, and then your yeah. final revenue, the final year, two thousand fifteen, was was in the ten million range. Right. Mm-hmm. On forty people. Yep. Which is an unbelievable number for productivity. Yep. On a revenue per yep. staff member. <laughs> so you you all well, all on a very small ticket price, right? Like it was a volume business. Yeah. So I mean, like I can't even mm-hmm. and and with a volume business on custom order. So, yeah, which is why we built that software. Yeah, which is so Was cool. even like, I mean, we started in the early days typing the names on the labels. And then we started cutting and pasting. We'd make like a big Word document out of all the orders and cut and paste. And then we had barcodes and they would pop- populate. And then we had automation. But there was still a lot of tinkering with the automation, like just... Uh, playing with the size, putting in two layers. And so the production operator would sit and customize extensively. And so then we started optimizing that through software. Crazy. So it's mm-hmm. a very iterative process. Yeah. So yeah. Um, one of the things, maybe it was you even that mentioned this in the last time we got together, was that you have technology debt. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so, like, people <laughs> will invest like crazy in technology. Yeah. But then... It goes antiquated. Yeah. Well, and how do you... I remember an example of where customer service wanted something fixed in the in the ERP. And uh, one of my guys had some... It was uh, Sprint Friday. So we had our Sprint wrap-up. We had a barbecue lunch. They always have free time that afternoon to do research or uh, pick a project that, you know, was bubbling off to the side and they weren't getting to it. And so he knew customer service it would mean a lot to them to fix this thing. So he sat down and he opened his workbench and he started pulling all the code in. And he said, and when I got to a thousand lines of code, I knew I wasn't fixing it that day. <laughs> and we had a big old laugh and, yeah, yeah. you know, but it was the example of the part of the program he was playing in was 
pretty old, one of the original pieces that had been built in the mid 2000s. Right. And you're getting to that point where it's been around a long time and it needs to be kind of ripped and replaced. But planning that and doing that is, is a lot of work. Yeah, for sure. It's a lot of work. So then how do you plan for that up front? And yes. what kind of things do you look at yeah. as technology advances all the time? Yeah, so one of the, we had kind of gone on to a five-year plan and in the midst of that sold the business. And then I left not too long after that, but we had redone the website. So at one time we had had like a custom coded built from the ground website that, you know, like we're talking pre-Shopify, pre any major platform. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. e-commerce. So, you know, we were working on a framework that was pretty old and held together a little bit, you know, as you get farther and farther down the road. A couple of rusty nails here and there. Yep. So we had done a big project to go on to the Magento platform, um, and that required a lot of updating in the ERP, but then we knew there were a whole section we weren't even touching, and we needed to do a project to do that. And I know that they've done it in the last couple of years, so it is, though, that constant. Something's always updated. Right. right. No matter what you do, like you launch today <laughs> and then the other part that attack, you know, that attaches to it or filters through it, it's outdated. So right. it is a constant merry go round, so to speak, isn't it? Yeah. And, and it's just an, an interesting thing, right? In terms of priorities and, and yeah. trying to figure out where the biggest levers are yes. and what you need to focus your time on because yes. you only have so much time. You could have had, I guess, you probably could have had a team of 70 if you wanted. Yeah. Well, and plumbing, plumbing isn't like not that sexy. Like, like grouping and replacing isn't new. It isn't exciting. It right. isn't like nobody really wants to think that, and it'll take two years. Right, right. Like no, nobody, no one wants that. I'm in, man. No one's getting excited <laughs> yeah, about that. But the problem becomes if you don't do it, the debt just grows, it balloons, and right. then you reach a point where you can't scale anymore because of the debt. Right. So that was a big piece for us. So then, um, you know, in terms of talking to other entrepreneurs, I mean, mm-hmm. that's kind of the whole purpose of this thing is to learn from entrepreneurs to yeah. grow your business. Um, when it comes to the technology side of things, mm-hmm. and you know, and I think what you mentioned was a really example where you had no technology background yeah you, you kind of had to immerse yourself and learn by it i'm under the impression that essentially everybody's going to be in that situation if they don't have technology chops yeah in the next five ten years yeah so what kind of advice would you give to those entrepreneurs that aren't in technology but need to start booching their yeah. way into ask up a lot chops? of questions ask a lot of questions find some people who do know about technology that can be mentors or even just sound of, does this make sense to you? And where do you um, find those people? I found, so through a network of advisors, I found a couple of people. Um, I had one guy that I paid for a while to give me some advice because we were struggling in a certain area of getting this software launched. And he kind of came on and helped us sort out what was working and what wasn't. He was more than just a mentor to me. Um, and build a network, like go to some tech things, do play in the circles, read the, you know, read tech crunch, read some of the things and try and stay on top of what's happening. That's cool. That's, I got great advice in, yeah. in, uh, in our area too, this year there was, um, was it True North? Was it mm-hmm. Waterloo, yeah. Was, and Collision was in Toronto. Collision was in Toronto. Yeah. Like, and, and then Web Summit's in Portugal. It's not far. No. Uh, in the grand scheme of things. It's yeah. Or there's one in Chicago too. There's a web Web Summit Chicago now. It's going to escape me the name of it, but well, I'll send sure. it to you for the show notes. <laughs> Whatever. Web Summit Chicago. Yeah. yeah. Googled. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. All the platform, all the big platform providers go, and like it is worth going to as well. And yeah, that's okay. an easy trip. Yeah. 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 So far, yeah. Chicago's no. awesome. Yeah. Get some pizza while you're there. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Go to a ball game. So, what are, you, what are you doing now? So, now I have been doing coaching and consulting. So, yeah. working with entrepreneurs and executives to develop their leadership. Cool. So one of the things that, I mean, we went from, like you said earlier, four people to 40. And you can't be the same person you were at four people at 40 people, right? right? You have to evolve yourself and, and step into that leadership role and learn how to motivate a team and how to give feedback to a team for the good or the bad, you know, to the people who report to you. And, and uh, I've always had a real philosophy of when people came to work for me, I wanted to send them out the door. The reality was at 40 people, we didn't have a career path for people, for right. the most part. Right, right, right. So they were going to come in and do their job, and when they were ready for that promotion, they were probably going to go. 
Yeah. We might be able to help a few people through a role or two, but overall, we couldn't. And so how could I develop that person and help them reach their goals and send them out the door better than they came in? And so to me, that's what coaching and working with entrepreneurs and executives is about, is is how do they show up for themselves and for their teams? And how do they need to show up tomorrow and next week and next month? And how how to help them grow and develop? Awesome. And so where are you doing that right now? And So right now, Zoom is a beautiful thing. Yeah, it is. So I can coach anybody, you know, anywhere. I do also meet some of my clients in person, depending. I have office space in Burlington that I can use to do that. How would someone reach out to you if they wanted to They could email me at julie, at julieellisandco.com. Sweet. Yeah. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for having me. It was great. All right, see you. Bye. All right, bye.